Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So being an entrepreneur comes with many challenges. The rapid evolution of technology more than in any other industry is an important challenge for young startups, which adds a lot of pressure to act quickly and to find a successful solution amongst the competition. Today with us is Monty, creator of MySQL and MariaDB, and open source advocate alongside with um, a lot of uh, history in this uh, experience in these areas. So today we will learn more about how innovation, disruption, and technology technology can lead your business to success. Monty, welcome and thank you for taking time for this. I will hand over to you and please lead us uh, to these topics. Thank you. So uh, happy to be here. I, I will today talk about, uh, uh, if I can get the slides working, about uh, disruption regarding MySQL and MariaDB and how it was possible to for a small group of people in uh, Finland, Sweden, uh, to create a database that is uh, today the second most uh, popular uh, relational database. So I assume you can uh, read, and so I will not try to talk about everything that's on the slides, but uh, it talks about the disruption from the side of MySQL and MariaDB. A little bit about uh, uh, the beginning of everything. So I started the university in 1981. I already have been working with Cube computers for uh, three years. And my first job was to convert uh, computer programs like uh, payrolls from COBOL to modern personal computers that just had come on the market. But what I did notice was that most of the programs was very, very similar basically a program where you created an input screen where you can type in uh, data in, at different positions and then you store it and then you did uh, print uh, printing and every screen had their own program that was somewhat similar but with small changes and about the same time Ala Larson the, who was the third founder of MySQL wanted me to use a database program for this uh, ABC 800, and uh, to do some payrolls applications. But I just thought that this is way too cumbersome to do it. It was very programmatic. And I thought that no end users could ever be able to use it. So what I did, um, and this is kind of my first disruptive uh, software project, is that I wrote a program called Reg Regota Hundra, which was then to become MySQL eventually. It was uh, written in basic first and a couple later I re wrote, rewrote it in C. And the whole idea was instead of doing any programming, I wanted to do a, for databases. I wanted to do something there where you just paint your screen uh, how you would like to have it um, on the computer where underscore would be where you put in text. And, and uh, then you would just press one button and it automatically will uh, create a database from there, pick, picking up the names from the screens for the fields. And uh, it took me uh, some months to do the first versions. But with that, I was able to do a bookkeeping program in just a few days compared to having to write uh, um, 10 different programs for the inputs and 10 different programs for the printing. And uh, they got to become the most popular database in Sweden. But this was in early 1980, ABC 800, which was the most sold computer in, in, in Sweden, um, had only sold 30,000 uh, copies, but more than 3,000, more than 10% of those was, uh, was using my program. And there were lots of applications written with it. And the nice thing was that uh, anybody, even, a, not even, but a secretary who has no knowledge in uh, computers could go and add a field or make a field longer with, where, without having to ask anyone. So, um, in 1994, I had some customers 
who was uh, using my database and they were using it remotely through modems. Um, they wanted to be able to access it through the web, which was a new thing in 94. So I wrote the SQL interface on top of the regulatory that was no name Unireg for Unix register. And uh, very soon afterwards, uh, we released it as a dual licensing and a dual license in 95. And dual license means that you could have it in two different uh, ways or you could use it in two different ways. You could either use it for free. If you don't did, didn't do any business on it, you didn't have to pay. But if you made uh, any business on it and earn the money, we had the license said that you should pay. But we didn't have any license keys or anything else. So if if you don't want to pay, at least you should have a bad conscience. But this was enough to bootstrap uh, the company that eventually become MySQL. And uh, we even back then we tried to do things in a dis disruptive way because in 94, 95, when you got a program uh, for um, for Sun OS or Linux, most programs was in source and you had to compile them uh, themselves. And because there were many different versions of Linux, is, you also have FreeBSD, OpenBSD and so on, and Windows. Uh, it was a high step to st start using open source. And um, because I've been using open source for, for a long while, I did know about this. So we did something that almost nobody did um, at that point in time. We made binaries for everything, uh, and in, including Windows. In 2000, we switched to GPL to have a proper license and GPL allowed us to do um, dual license in the way that the companies couldn't use the GPL license because they have um, they didn't like it or they didn't match their business models. They could buy exactly the same code, but to, where we just had changed the copyright to say that this is commercial software, and they were happy. So when I started with my SQL. There were lots of big players in the database market. You had Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, and others. And uh, they were, we realized it would be very hard to be able to compete with these on the same, um, with the same tools. And But we did have a, a, one benefit that these big players didn't believe in the internet. They saw that internet was a fad in the beginning, which allowed us um, to get a share, share of the database market. So because the license was basically free to use uh, for most, um, the adoption of, of MySQL skyrocketed from the beginning and uh, from getting into the hobbyists, uh, there, from there, it spread uh, to the enterprises because uh, when somebody needed a database, they searched around. Phone MySQL was the most popular one. They tried it; it worked, and then they started to do uh, base their business on it. And uh, after a while, if their business was serious, they understood that they would need support, and then they contacted. Uh, uh, MySQL AB, our company, to buy support. And um, over the years, we kind of noticed that, uh, that uh, about one customer in 1,000 pays, which uh, uh, may sound uh, bad, but if you have 10 million or 50 million customers or users, uh, one in 1,000 is a pretty good deal, especially when you do have to do no marketing and having no salespersons to um, spread the product. Uh, so, uh, so why did we decided to go open source? 
So David Axmarker is the second founder uh, in MySQL and me, we've been using free software for about 10 years. And we always wanted to give something back. We had lo done lots of projects, but there were very few of those that would be suitable for the general public. MySQL was basically the first one. So we wanted to give something back. But at the same time, we also wanted to work full time on the product and earn enough money so we can employ people. And back, back then, uh, most open source uh, was totally free. You could use it for, for basic for whatever. And there were no way to ensure that you could have a predictive income. And that's why we come up with this uh, dual licensing. Um, and we were the second pro program who used that uh, at all, Ghost was the first, but we were the first one who, uh, who come up how to use dual licensing on GPL. And uh, um, normally when you start a new company, you need money to bootstrap it to ensure that you get salaries. But we basically went from our old job to, new, uh, to work fully on MySQL because within two months, we already was earning our salaries. And then we just hire people according to the uh, income that we had. So going from MySQL to MariaDB, we created MariaDB because uh, Oracle bought uh, uh, Sun to get their hands on uh, MySQL. And uh, I feared that uh, all my work would be basically in vain because I wanted to change the database history, uh, the database industry. And with Oracle, who has no reason to promote a free project because uh, any user of MySQL is a user, uh, a lost user of the commercial databases. And uh, we did expect Oracle to close down the development of MySQL, which they actually did. They are not following it, uh, developing MySQL as an open source project. Basically, development is closed. So in MariaDB, we wanted to be disruptive against MySQL. So uh, we made it clear from the beginning that MariaDB is fully open source. And we made a lot of uh, efforts to ensure that every development is happening in the open. It should be as easy to be part of the developer community. If you are a part of MariaDB, MariaDB AB, or if you be outside of it. I also created the MariaDB Foundation as an assurance that MariaDB would always be open source. So nobody can buy MariaDB and close it down the way that uh, Oracle has been succeeding with MySQL. <clears throat> and uh, doing these steps convinced almost all Linux distribution and other free uh, operating systems that we trust MariaDB, we don't trust MySQL. And today you can uh, only find MySQL in Ubuntu of, uh, when it comes to Linux distributions. And other free operating systems doesn't support MySQL on the MariaDB. And uh, by working with other projects and uh, users, we also ensure that MariaDB has become a first class citizen and supported by lots of projects like WordPress, uh, Django. We have connect connectors from lots of languages, but uh, we have been lucky that uh, com the community, open source community maintains a big part of them. And we also have Acronis who so uh, supports uh, backup solutions using MariaDB. So uh, a lot of the things that made MySQL successful, what was was it was very easy to use and download. You, when you heard about uh, or found about MySQL because you need a database, you could just download it and get it to work within minutes. The 50 minutes time originally was including the time it takes to download uh, MySQL. And um, Initially, we were uh, a web database 
to try uh, and actually one of the first databases who was designed for the web. But uh, things has changed um, and uh, because of uh, the fact that um, the big players in the database market, they are, not they are not growing anymore because most people know, chooses um, an open source uh, database. So the, what the big vendors has been doing is they are increasing the prices for the existing customers just to be able, able to get the same income they have got before. And uh, customers doesn't like when prices increases every year and they have nothing to say about it. So there's a lots of pressure inside the companies to move away from uh, Oracle, SQL Server, others to open source databases. And um, we have taken a lot of steps for being the, 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 the database of choice uh, for these kind of customers. So I was part of implementing Oracle mode into MariaDB some five, six years ago, which allows uh, uh, many Oracle applications to move to MariaDB almost unchanged and saving millions in, um, in cost for licensing and support. You, normally, if you go from, go from Oracle to MariaDB, you pay in the end about uh, a tenth of what you paid before and you get the similar level of support that you should expect as an enterprise. So, uh, it, but it was not all only about uh, licenses uh, when it comes to a uh, disruption, right? I think that the license uh, and the community was the two biggest disruptive elements. But we also had other secret sources that allowed us to do more with less. So with uh, MySQL and also with MariaDB, we have uh, separate the database layer and the storage layer through a very simple interface that almost anybody can implement. And that allows you to have different engines for different things. If you want to use uh, analytical data, an analytical database, you can use column store uh, as an engine for some of your tables. And then you get an, uh, can handle analytical workloads. Connect allows you to um, connect to other databases like MongoDB. So you can, um, using Connect, you can have um, MariaDB as a source, but then you can join with data, uh, data in Postgres, uh, Oracle, uh, SQL Server, and even MongoDB with one query. There's no other database who can do that as flexible as MariaDB. We also have uh, in the SkySQL, the, the MariaDB SaaS offering, we have an engine called Expand that is, gives you linear, linear scalability for writes that this allows you to solve one of the big problems in when doing a logging of uh, data from devices. Because uh, if you need more write speed, you just add uh, another computer. So it, it has unlimited, unlimited write scalability. We also have an S3 engine, which is, uh, allows you to uh, share your data with anybody else uh, through the S3 interface. And you can, it's just one command to change your uh, data to an S3 engine. And then anybody who has MariaDB can access it if you just give them the credentials for accessing your S3 storage. So there were a lot of work with, with creating MariaDB from MySQL. And uh, so because if a fork in open source is usually uh, regarded as a, something bad, that means that the original project has failed um, for enough for users who think it's um, worth to do a fork. With uh, working uh, MySQL, I need to have a team, I need to provide documentation and do a 
build and test environment, everything else. This took basically us about uh, four months to do. And the reason I was successful in doing that was that I was able to convince uh, a major part of the best developers of MySQL to switch over to MariaDB. And that was because they didn't trust Oracle and they liked to work with me. And uh, when we got out uh, MariaDB, we started to work with them, operating system distributions uh, to get them to use MariaDB. And thanks to the MariaDB Foundation and the trust they had in uh, me and our developers, they all, all, almost all switched to use MariaDB. And all of this was possible to do because Oracle very cl uh, clearly has shown that they don't care about the community. They don't want to work with developers. They are not inclined to take changes. They don't uh, write about their plans of MariaDB and so on. With MySQL, we could sell licenses. With, with MariaDB, we couldn't because we don't own the code. We are bound by the GPL license from MySQL. So uh, we started by um, having de developer source, uh, developer support and um, paid support. But um, because of um, how Oracle was uh, salespeople was working with the current customer of, my, of MySQL, we didn't get any paying customers for the first three years. That was because when um, Oracle announced that they will buy Sun, all the Sun salespeople went out to the customers and said that, um, you know, Oracle's buying uh, Sun and MySQL, your prices will go up. So no, you should uh, um, take a three to five year project uh, contract to ensure that uh, you don't have any unfortunate events with pricing and everybody bought it. So for the first uh, three to five years, I paid everything in with the program AB, who was the company behind MariaDB. But um, after creating the foundations and we got some sponsors for it, uh, and uh, we, when we got into distributions, we started to get more and more people moving to MariaDB. And uh, especially when we added Oracle layer, we started to get big enterprises moving from uh, Oracle to uh, MariaDB. And that uh, helped a lot. When it comes to other uh, open source companies who want to be disruptive, I would say that if you can use the GPL license, uh, you should, because that gives you a big spread of your product, everybody can use it. And those who want to uh, embed your project into theirs, they will have to pay. And you can make a really good income for, the, for that and compete with any close, close source vendor. Not where they are making as much money as they, uh, they are because closed source companies still make more money. But uh, you can help more people and you can still make uh, million dollar or even billion dollar business that we were, were able to do with MySQL and we are now trying to do with MariaDB. But the problem with the GPL is only works for infrastructure pro, pro, uh, programs because GPL says that uh, if you use uh, this code in yours, you also have to be GPL. And, uh, if, uh, and if you are a company like Adobe who uh, including MySQL with Adobe. They don't want to, that Adobe would be GPL, so they pay a license for doing that. But what if you have a program that is a, a music player or video player or some or a game, then GPL doesn't help you. So that's why uh, me and David Axmark, uh, we created the business source license. It offers a middle ground between closed source and open source. The idea is that um, all code is open from the beginning, so it's available. Uh, any user can download, use it, change it, and modify it for their own need. It's like, exactly like 
it will be open source. But the license tells uh, that under these circumstances, you can use it for free. Under these circumstances, you have to pay. So in this case, it's kind of a um, normal commercial software. But the big idea here is that the license guarantees that after a certain amount of years, usually uh, I recommend three years, the code should become GPL, in other words, open source. And uh, it also means that uh, most of the benefits a, a company has with using open source software, in other words, you have, you're not depending on one vendor. Uh, if the vendor goes out of business, you can still continue using that. All of those still applies to, to, uh, for BSL software. The bad thing is that you have to pay for the software, but on the other hand, you also get support and you can ensure that the project uh, actually has a chance to uh, survive. And MariaDB Corporation is used in BSL for max scale, our proxy, and we, uh, Croc, Croc, Cockroach DB is also used in the, uh, BSL. We also encourage, encourage other companies to use BSL because uh, as the more people get to know about it, the easier it is for the people to do business around it. So when when I'm, I'm a partner in Open Ocean, uh, a Finnish um, investment company, and when we are talking with companies doing uh, open source, I always recommend them to look at BSL if they don't yet know how they, they should earn money. So uh, this is a summary of what made MySQL successful. First, we were really lucky with the timing. Everybody needed a database uh, uh, for the web, and it was a stable product because I've been using it since uh, the, the base code for, since 85. We didn't have all the features, but at least what we had was stable. Uh, we also created a virtual company, uh, but one of the first big virtual companies because uh, I was in Finland, David Axmark was in, in Sweden. So we already were multinational from uh, day one. And then uh, when some uh, people from Yugoslavia asked for a job and then Germany, we just employed them. We just took the best people everywhere because we were already used to working from, uh, as remote. And when MySQL was sold to Sun, uh, we were some 450 people where a majority was working remotely. So at least for this COVID incident, when it comes to MariaDB uh, developers, it has uh, had basically no effect because we already was working from home. The license was that free for most of you have to pay just so we can uh, uh, earn money to do a uh, uh, business. We made it very easy to install. Uh, we did lots of testing be before it's a, a release. And I think one of the most important things from the beginning, we were very friendly to the community. During the first five years, I wrote personally 30,000 emails just to help people who had uh, problems with using MySQL. And uh, there, this was not paying uh, paid for people. This was normal users. I think also one of the reasons we were quite successful that uh, we waited with the investment into the company until we believed this product was good enough. One of the biggest uh, problems uh, or mistakes I see with entrepreneurs is that they take money too early with angel investors and lose control of the company very, very soon. Instead of waiting and get a more relevant share of the company when it's finally sold. So my squirrel was something was needed and it was stable and easy to use for the right price at the right time. Okay, I tried to get it to, to 30 minutes and we are at the 30 minutes mark. So we are, let's open for questions. 
Thank you so much, Monty, for this comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, I think that actually we got a really uh, interesting questions. And uh, moreover, we have a lot of uh, discussion on our YouTube channel. So thank you all for uh, chatting about this. Uh, one question that we, ha uh, we got is any tips on how to keep pace with new trends and innovations? And actually, um, I got this question a lot of time because um, right now innovations and trends are changing really fast. How we can keep up with that and still, you know, stay focused on the things that we have to do? Um, if you have a project like MariaDB, where there are lots of users, things are easy. The thing is that I don't have a crystal ball to knowing what where the industry will go next. And when you're a developer in a small company, you, you can't have time even to find it out. But if you have enough active uh, users, they will tell and you have a open channel with them. They will tell you what they plan to do next. And as long as you are there, ensuring that uh, when they are at the next stage, you are there waiting for them, you are part of the future. So in other words, listen to your customers, work with them, find out what they need, and uh, implement those parts that most of your customers need. Then you're always before the trend. Thank you so much. Um, so another question is more about disruption. It says how to understand if my product is disruptive enough. The thing is that you have to look at your, your competitor and see uh, what are they doing wrong? What can you do, do better? And uh, especially when it comes to price, can you compete with them? And if you only going to charge one tenth of what they do, you have to sell uh, 10 times more. So you just have to look at uh, where things are, and the competitors will tell you uh, what they do wrong. And especially if something is too hard to use, like I said, say, uh, told earlier with uh, 800 was that this was just a new way to do something much better, much simpler. So you could do something what other people spend one month doing. If you can do that, the same thing in one day, and it looks the same for the customer then you have already a better solution. Uh, so uh, are there, you mentioned already some of the challenges about disruption of innovation, et cetera, but are there any hidden barriers uh, when young company uh, could face when it comes to innovation and disruption? I see the biggest problem that uh, uh, people have who have real bright ideas, they don't know how to monetize it. And they need to concentrate on that because uh, you can have the best software and everything else, but if you don't know how to sell it and actually explain the software in an easy way, then you will not get customers. I think actually it's uh, equally hard uh, for entrepreneurs to actually explain their software shortly uh, as they uh, as for them to monetize. I don't know how many times I've been sitting at the presentation and after 20 minutes, I actually have to ask, so what does your software actually solve? Uh, which actually leads me to another point. Uh, recently, um, I saw some representation about, uh, it's called 5C. It says that you need to be centric uh, towards like, uh, okay, customer context, et cetera. So uh, the idea of the whole uh, presentation is that, uh, the uh, centric of uh, customers is actually really rare and a lot of startups um, are starting from the point of their own idea and they're forgetting uh, what actually their product can offer to the customers. Uh, what do you think this is this really important and how um, maybe startups can switch you know their mindset from this point to actually being customer centric? I've always been customer centric. Everything I've done, except a few games that I did in my early days that I did just for myself and to show uh, my friends that computers can be useful. Everything else I did always because I saw a customer having a problem. I go, we went to them, have a solution and solve that and then went to the next one. So uh, there's extremely little that is done both in my square and MariaDB that was not because uh, a customer asked and he wanted it. 
What about the customer journey? Uh, I mean, they said that um, uh, there is actually they said that uh, how customer will pick uh, the product that he likes, especially if, of course, it's not the only one on the market. It's uh, based on the emotions that this product will uh, like feel, the solutions that it will give, and the amount of necessary steps that someone will take in order to integrate or use the solution. Um, so, what do you think? What are the main gaps? in uh, this customer journey here, and is this really important and what is in which stage we need to think about the customer journey? Uh, you have two uh, issues with customers. First, you need to get them. And for that, you have have a product that's interesting. But uh, when you got in the foot into, into the door and they are happy with you, uh, then it's your job to keep them happy, talk with them, interact with them, ensure that they feel heard that they feel almost as part of the team. The, and that's the way that you keep customers. And I think that's uh, absolutely fundamental for anybody who uh, works in a market where you don't have an infinite number of customers. Because, for example, a, a restaurant at, at a busy, busy place, they can have really, really bad food and just sell it cheap because they don't expect the customers to come in ever again, it doesn't matter because there's always a new customer. With entrepreneurs who do software, you want to have the customer getting their the product in to one part of the organization and spread it all over the organization. And that only works if you do quality and listen to them. Um, one more question is, um how to get innovative in this world. So I believe that, you know, a lot of things are changing really fast. We are getting a lot of new products around us, a lot of new possibilities. Um, and uh, I believe that somehow, you know, our brains are getting um, stuck because we have already a lot of things around us and it's hard to find something innovative. Uh, how, what do you think? I mean, how we can switch off or on our brain and try to think really in an innovative way? I will just say what, uh, what I do is that I'm looking at something and, and, and uh, how would I do this better? How would I do this uh, uh, easier to use from the, from the user point of view? Um, um, lots of people look at just how easy things is to develop, but the customer doesn't really care that. Of course, if the price is cheaper, it's good, but you have to see that does it solve the, the problem that they want in the, the way that they want? And um, I always uh, had the notion that customer is king and you have to listen to them. But that doesn't mean that the customer is always right. A king can be very, very confused. But you don't go to a king and say that uh, you are stupid, you are wrong. You go to him and say that, uh, uh, let's discuss another solution to the, your problem that may solve this and something more also. We can do it cheaper. And then you go that way. You always need to treat a king and, in other words, a customer with respect and uh, and solve their problems, but not necessary in the way that they want it. But they need Clear. to agree. Clear, completely agree. Uh, a question that we got is actually a really interesting and um, I, I would say that it's something that definitely we will need to discuss in the future and actually recent future is um, it says effect of metaverse on disruption okay do you do you have any I mean I, we still don't have I believe any examples but what do you think about this what do you think uh, for example I believe that at some point you know we will have to research how to do these events in the metaverse and quite soon um, so what do you think how this will affect uh, this disruption let's say I haven't followed the metaverse discussion I think that uh, um, I like uh, working with people in person and uh, having uh, people just be avatars doesn't sound very exciting. So in this, this question, I have to pass because uh, I'm not even using Facebook. It just takes too much time. I'm trying to be productive and I don't see metaverse being productive. Uh, one question regarding um, uh, your part where you mentioned about MariaDB. It says MariaDB didn't have paying customers during the first three years. So what made you believe that MariaDB eventually would be able to be financially successful? And how did you keep going for so long time with uh, no funds? Uh, 
my school was uh, sold to Maridi because I got a lot of money from that deal. I did put a major part of that money to saving uh, my school under the name of MariaDB because, okay, sorry, this is a long answer. But anyway, so because when I, uh, I've been speaking about my school and open source for tens of years and convinced a lot of people to trust uh, both my SQL and open source. And if Oracle would have been able to kill my SQL, I would feel that I betrayed every single one who trusted me in using my SQL. And also, they could also cause a problem for people believing in open source. I didn't want that to happen. That's why I spent uh, so much money on um, creating MariaDB. I also wanted to ensure that all the really clever developers who have been working with me a long time on my SQL would have a work for life. So, uh, and uh, I did know about the salespeople going offer uh, this uh, cheap uh, or cheaper service contract. So I did know that this will take three years. Um, actually, this is the attitude, uh, never give up, definitely it will bring a lot of success. Uh, uh, actually, I have a great example of um, uh, Howard uh, from Starbucks. So he got rejected uh, 217 times, uh, but now he uh, actually has revenue of $31.3 billion. And um, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So um, do you think that actually this attitude, never give up, uh, is one of the let's say, main attitudes when you are starting some new job, new business and everything that will lead you to, to success? I think that's kind of a sign of a good, good uh, entrepreneur. You are prepared to do everything. You are prepared to uh, go uh, through walls. If somebody says this is impossible, you tell them that, don't disturb me, I'm just fixing it. Clear. Thank you so much for uh, this presentation. And uh, I'm sure that we will see you again on our next webinar that we will announce. Um, thank you so much once again. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for your questions. And uh, follow uh, SAT.org and uh, check uh, all other events that we will introduce in the next period. Thank you, Monty, once again. Thank you. And see you in the next uh, webinar. See you.